I'm Joe Liston, president of the Northwest China Council for this 40th anniversary year. John Wong, executive director of the uh, China Council, is working behind the scenes tonight producing our event. So thank you, John. Briefly, for those of you who are unfamiliar with the Northwest China Council, we are an educational nonprofit formed in 1980 from a grant from the Asia Society of New York to improve cultural understanding just as China was opening up to the US and the world. We are based here in the Pacific Northwest in Portland, Oregon. Um, and in a normal non-pandemic year, we offer a variety of cultural programming as well as some educational programs focused on business uh, relations, um, various types of programs we offer. This year, however, out of necessity and safety, we've moved uh, to a more virtual strategy um, including these China chats. Uh, we also offer Mandarin Chinese lessons uh, as well virtually. A quick logistical uh, note for everyone. Um, at the end of Mr. Kaufman's presentation tonight, um, I will moderate a question and answer session. Feel free to submit your questions uh, to Mr. Kaufman during the presentation and I will read them at the end. Um, Tonight, we're honored to welcome Mr. Jonathan Kaufman, a Pulitzer Prize winning journalist with 30 years of experience reporting in China, from the Boston Globe to the Wall Street Journal to Bloomberg News. He covered the Tiananmen Square massacre in 1989 and served as China bureau chief for the Wall Street Journal. Mr. Kaufman is the author of A Hole in the Heart of the World, Being Jewish in Eastern Europe and Broken Alliance, The Turbulent Times Between Blacks and Jews in America winner of the National Jewish Book Award. He is also director of the School of Journalism at Northeastern University in Boston. Tonight, Mr. Kaufman will talk about his latest book, The Last Kings of Shanghai, an epic multi-generational story of two rival Jewish dynasties that flourished in Hong Kong and Shanghai in 20th century China. So without further ado, we welcome you, Jonathan, and I'll turn it over to you. Thanks very much. Uh, thank you very much, Joe. I appreciate it. Um, so, um, oh, uh, thank you very much for having uh, for having me. Um, you know, it's it's an unusual circumstance publishing a book during a pandemic when all the bookstores are closed and you can't fly anywhere. So, I, I appreciate um, the effort that you folks have made to zoom in and um, and uh, uh, hear about my book and then share your thoughts with me. I'm, I'm really happy to be with you. Um, you know, I think one of the questions people always have when I'm talking about the book is, how did you stumble on this? topic. And um, it, it really starts back uh, in 1979, you know, many years ago. I was a young journalist and I was in Shanghai. Uh, China had just opened up, if you remember, by 79. Mao had been dead, um, you know, only three years. And China was very much the old uh, communist China. Everybody wore the, uh, the Mao suits. Um, there were lots of bicycles and very few uh, very few uh, cars. And I was walking along the Bund, um, that great Art Deco waterfront in Shanghai, and I had to use the bathroom. And so I went into a hotel, the Peace Hotel, uh, to see if there was a bathroom in there. And I felt like I had walked into a 1930s movie. Um, the floors were marble, the, these Lalique uh, crystal chandeliers. There was a bellhop all dressed in white with a little white um, cap on his head. Um, it was like stepping back in time. And I, I went up to the bellhop and in English, I asked if there was a men's room that I could use and he responded to me in French. So this kind of jarring contrast really got me thinking like, what, what is this place? And although now I'm, I'm, I'm guess, you know, I'm, I'm in part a historian, I think for journalists, uh, books or ideas or great stories often start with a great question. So um, I began to kind of, as I would go to China frequently over the years covering it um, for the Wall Street Journal and the Boston Globe and, and then for Bloomberg, I began to sort of gather string. And I found I kept on stumbling across these kind of interesting uh, uh, places that, that seemed to hold some kind of hidden history. Um, when I was back there during 1989, during the Tiananmen massacre, um, we all were assigned minders. In other words, people who were assigned by the Chinese foreign ministry to make sure that you didn't ask embarrassing questions. And of course we would sneak away to report on what was happening. But when I was in Shanghai, my minder there, you know, wanted to take me to what he called the children's palace. And it was a place he told me where Chinese children do their ballet lessons and violin lessons. You know, the kind of upbeat, uh, nice place that they would want an American journalist to see instead of writing about, 
uh, what was going on in Beijing and the, the tumult all across China. So I went along dutifully and um, it was this huge, beautiful um, mansion really. It was more than 40 rooms. Um, the ballroom was like the size of a football field. Um, it really looked like an English country house. And as I was leaving, there was a little plaque I noticed by the door, um, which said this had once been the home of the Kaduri family. Now, the pieces began to fall in place because the Peace Hotel, someone told me, had once been built by Victor Sassoon. Uh, Victor Sassoon was Jewish. He was once one of the richest men in the world in the 1930s, and he had built this, uh, this grand hotel. The Kaduris I knew because they um, were uh, uh, based in Hong Kong now. I, I, I had been living in Hong Kong myself, and uh, they were very well known in Hong Kong. Um, again, a Jewish family um, that owned the Peninsula Hotel and all sorts of investments and were one of the richest families in Hong Kong at that time. And then another time I was in, uh, 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 I was based in, in China with my family as the bureau chief of the Wall Street Journal, and we went to Shanghai and I ended up in sort of a poor Chinese neighborhood uh, just to the north of the Bund. And we were going down all these alleyways and I noticed that um, in a lot of the doorposts, there were mezuzahs. These are the kind of ritual objects. They look uh, like um, sort of very narrow rectangular um, objects that, um, that Jews put on their doorposts and um, for, for religious purposes. And I noticed there were the shadows of these mezuzahs in, in all these, uh, the doorways of all these houses. And so again, I was trying to figure out what, what was going on with, with sort of these Jews popping up everywhere and what was this history. So that really is what led me to work on this book and to understand what it was that brought these families um, to China and what their, what their legacy had been. And so the story um, really starts not in China, but in Baghdad. Um, Baghdad was historically called Babylon, and you'll remember from your Bible, uh, there's that famous verse where um, the Jews say um, they, had been, they had been exiled from Jerusalem, they were in Babylon, and they said, by the rivers of Babylon we wept when we thought of Zion. Um, and this was really the, the start of, of this saga. Um, which was that um, when Nebuchadnezzar conquered Jerusalem, he took groups of Jews and, and brought them to Baghdad, um, which was then called Babylon. But the truth is, while the Jews may have wept in the Bible, Babylon actually was a pretty wonderful place for them. Um, the the uh, uh, Nebuchadnezzar and his successors, the Persians, and then the, the Ottoman Empire, um, really relied on the Jews to help run their economy. Um, they even incorporated them into government where they became sort of the secretary of the treasury, um, advising the government on tax policy. And um, the Jews became quite prominent um, in the business and economics um, of Baghdad. And in fact, they became so prominent that the successive rulers of Baghdad going back 2000 years would name one family, a preeminent family as the, literally the, the king of the Jews. And, and this person would be the person that they would deal with on governmental issues or big economic issues. Um, and the Sassoons, uh, the, the, the um, Victor Sassoon's family um, were these, uh, were, was this prominent family. Starting in the 1700s, uh, the Sassoons in Baghdad became incredibly wealthy. They set up trading networks all around the Middle East. And when the the, the Nazi Sassoon was taken through the streets of Baghdad uh, to meet with the Pasha. Uh, he was carried on a sedan chair and people, Jews and non-Jews alike, would bow their heads respectfully as he passed um, because his stature was so, was so high. Well, as often happens, um, uh, things uh, turned uh, against the Jews um, around the 1820s. And the Pashas of Baghdad began to kidnap Jews and imprison them and hold them for ransom. So um, David Sassoon, who was in his 30s at that point, had been groomed to take over the dynasty, groomed to take over this immensely wealthy um, uh, family and, and, and the business. Uh, he was put in prison. Uh, held for ransom. And his father realized that this was just going to be the beginning. And so he, he ransomed him out of prison and quickly hustled him down to the port um, where he slipped him onto a ship um, that would take him away from Baghdad. And as he was leaving, he slipped a, a cloak over his shoulders and the cloak inside was sewn with pearls. 
um, to, uh, to give him a start. Now, I, I tell this story in part because I think when we think of the story of Jews and Jewish success and Jewish achievement, we often think of Fiddler on the Roof, right? That the story of Jews in Europe who start out poor, living in ghettos like the Rothschilds and others, or even here in America, um, you know, Michael Bloomberg or or other well-known uh, Jewish uh, financiers and, and, and businessmen who kind of start out poor and then work their way up and, and become quite influential and, and wealthy. Um, but, but the story of the Sassoons was different. It was really almost Shakespearean. It was a great family that was enormously wealthy already in the 16, 17, and 1800s um, that was used to being essentially royalty in, in Baghdad that had all that ripped away from them. And I think the story of the Sassoons uh, after they leave Baghdad and make their way to China is of trying to regain that authority, to try to regain that influence. Um, they're trying to regain their their royal lineage and their um, and the power that flowed from that. So David Sassoon, um, his very first night uh, out of Baghdad, um, he ended up sleeping on a warehouse floor uh, with a gun shooting rats. Um, but he does begin over the next few years to rebuild his fortune. Um, he is, uh, speaks many languages. He's a very savvy businessman. And um, he basically encounters the British who at this very moment uh, in the 1830s and 1840s are conquering India and about to take India and make it part of, um, part of the British Empire. And the British at this point um, also decide to wage war against China. And their war against China, as I'm sure many of you know, was not to conquer territory, but it was to open China for business. Um, and so the opium wars are very much driven by the desire to open up China, which had been a closed society, and, and, and allow British businesses to expand there. Um, David Sassoon is living in India. He sees the power of the British, and he decides to become a British citizen. Um, even though he himself doesn't speak any English, he makes sure that his eight sons all learn English. And when Queen Victoria ascends to the throne, he takes his sons out onto the embankment in Bombay and has them cheer the ascension of Queen Victoria and, uh, and sing God Save, God Save the Queen. So uh, he also begins to, to dabble in opium. Um, the opium trade is incredibly lucrative and it's legal in Bombay. And um, he begins to, uh, uh, to trade in opium. And then when China opens up, he looks at China and thinks, this is going to be one of the great, uh, great business opportunities of the time. And so he has eight sons and he essentially deploys these eight sons across China and ultimately to London and to the Middle East to become kind of the nodes of his business empire. <laughs> and I have to imagine what it was like. I mean, any of you who have been to China, I mean, yes, China can feel like a third world country in parts. Now, obviously, places like Shanghai are, you know, incredibly well developed. But I mean, China back then, as, as someone wrote, you know, was maybe a good place to do business, but a terrible place to live. Um, there was all sorts of disease. Um, there were very few foreigners who were living there. Um, the Sassoons didn't speak any Chinese. Um, and it really was kind of almost like the, the, the frontier of its day, where if you were ambitious and young, most of the Sassoons were in their 20s when they arrived in China, some were even younger. Um, it was a place where you could make your fortune. And so the first way the Sassoons make their fortune is with opium. And this is something that I think the family doesn't like talking about. Um, but the reality is um, they were very effective in the opium trade, and much of their fortune uh, came from came from opium. Um, what the Sassoons were able to do, much like Silicon Valley entrepreneurs these days, is that they took advantage of all these innovations in technology. So, for example, other British firms, bigger British firms, were using sailing ships to go from. Bombay and India, where the opium was, they would then sail over a matter of days or weeks um, to Shanghai and Hong Kong and distribute the opium there. Well, the Sassoons began uh, investing in steamships. Um, they would invest in steamships, which would move much faster, and that allowed them to kind of beat the competition when it came time to sell the opium. 
In the same way, the Sassoons were the first businesses in Asia to invest in the telegraph, which was a new invention. Um, and it allowed them to have uh, some of the sons in Shanghai and Hong Kong communicating via telegraph with other members of the family in Bombay and decide when was the right time to sell uh, opium. So for them, the, the sale of opium was very much um, a business transaction. But it is true, they knew how damaging opium was. Um, even though it was legal in, in uh, India um, and was forced to become legal in uh, China because the British forced the Chinese emperors to make opium legal, um, it had terrible impact um, on China. Probably 12% of China was addicted to opium. The effects, even to the Sassoons, were obvious. When you go through the Sassoon archives, you can read about all the workers they had to, to fire, um, uh, Chinese workers, because they were addicted to opium. Um, but the Sassoons make their fortune. They actually drive these other firms out of business. And um, once opium is finally made illegal um, in uh, 1912, 1913, um, they're able to convert their money into uh, real estate, um, uh, they, a big, they build trams there, they, build, they, they control the gas works. They become one of the most powerful and wealthiest families in Shanghai. Now, as I said, Victor Sass, uh, David Sassoon had these eight sons and he scattered them all around the world. Some of them moved to London where they hobnobbed with royalty. They would go to Buckingham Palace. They would buy English country houses. Um, and the business basically was, was not, they didn't pay enough attention to the business. And there was increasing concern among the Sassoons about who was gonna run the business in China. And so along comes Victor Sassoon. Victor Sassoon was part of one of the branches of the family that had gone to London and he was a playboy. Um, he went to Cambridge. He was always seen with a, a, a chorus girl on either arm. And the family basically didn't have much hope for him. They just figured he would be another wastrel, uh, 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 you know, teenager and then in his 20s um, who would just be kind of spending money and never trying to make it. But during World War I, Victor Sassoon was in an airplane accident, uh, flying missions during World War I. And he basically felt um, that he would never be able to kind of enjoy the high life he had been enjoying in London up until then. Um, he was crippled, his, he used canes to walk, and he felt that nobody would ever marry him because he was no longer the bon vivant and the playboy that he had been before his accident. So he moved to China. And it turns out that he is an incredibly smart businessman. And um, he begins to expand the Sassoon empire uh, to textiles in India, um, to all sorts of investments, including a beer company in Shanghai. And he builds this wonderful hotel, the Peace Hotel, um, where I had first uh, uh, encountered him in a way um, when I was looking for a men's room. And the Peace Hotel, he designed it, it was called the Cafe Hotel when he was building it to be the greatest hotel in Asia. And it was, he brought in, um, you know, dining room uh, managers from, from London. He brought in architects from all around the world. And um, he had these luxurious rooms. And to give you a sense of Victor Sassoon, um, he built his own suite uh, on the top floor of the Cafe Hotel. He had his office there, but then he also had his living quarters there. And when I visited the Cafe Hotel for the first time, um, I, uh, I went up there and, and they were taking me around, the Chinese uh, um, folks who ran the hotel now were taking me around. And in Victor Sassoon's beautiful marble bathroom, there were two bathtubs. And I said, why are there two bathtubs in here from the 1930s? And they said, well, Victor Sassoon used to say, I don't mind sharing my bed, but I don't like sharing my bath. So that was what Victor Sassoon was like. And that's what Shanghai was like. Uh, in the 1930s, Shanghai became one of the great cities uh, of the world. If you were a rich, um, uh, a, a, a rich man in, in, uh, in Europe or in America and wanted to take the grand tour, you would go to Shanghai. You would, you would take a ship uh, to Shanghai and you would go there not only to sort of absorb the exotic culture, but also it was a naughty place. Um, uh, Wallace Simpson, who would go on to marry the King of England and have him leave his throne, uh, had pictures taken there of her dressed only in a, uh, uh, only in a very, very scantily clad, um, uh, dressed uh, 
you know, in, in these very provocative outfits. She would go at brothels to sort of learn sexual techniques. Charlie Chaplin would go to Shanghai to hobnob with Victor Sassoon and to uh, talk about movies he wanted to make. Noel Coward wrote, um, uh, wrote his play Private Lives at the Cafe Hotel. It was, it was a place that sort of combined, as I say, the exoticism of China with a, a, almost a libertine feeling to it. And Victor Sassoon contributed to that because he would have these incredible parties there where he would invite both wealthy Chinese as well as the British. And um, he would dress up as a circus master, a ringmaster, and have everyone dress up as circus acts. He would dress up as a, um, um, as a schoolmaster and have people dress up as children. It was quite, it was quite the highlight. Um, so during this kind of, 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 of roaring 20s and, and roaring 30s uh, time in Shanghai, suddenly on these, um, on these cruise ships, no longer is it wealthy Europeans and Americans showing up, but Jewish refugees start showing up. Um, by 1938-39, the Nazis were completely in power in Germany. Um, they had annexed uh, Austria. And um, Jews were trying to flee both countries. And as we know, most countries uh, were essentially shutting their doors um, uh, to Jewish refugees. But word got out uh, in Austria, in, in Vienna, and also in Berlin that, that, that you could go to Shanghai. And the reason was the British came to Shanghai first, then the Americans, then the French, then the Japanese, then the Germans. And each time, these groups uh, sort of demanded from China a segment, a slice of Shanghai that they could control. So while part of Shanghai was a Chinese city and, and run by the Chinese government, that whole area around the Bund and to either side of it were controlled by either the British, the Americans, the French, and others. And what that meant was that there wasn't really a functioning government in Shanghai. And what government there was, was really run by businessmen, uh, colonial businessmen like Victor Sassoon. So um, the Jews began to hear, they were in a panic in Vienna uh, and in Berlin, and they began to hear that you could go into Shanghai without a visa. And so starting in 1937, 38, um, Jews start arriving on these cruise ships. Now, you have to imagine, they didn't speak any uh, Chinese. They were in a panic just trying to leave uh, Germany and Austria. And here they suddenly show up, you know, in this teeming Chinese city. And Victor Sassoon, while very much a playboy, um, also, in a way, this was his great moment where um, he, religion was never very important to him. I, I like to say that he was far more likely to give money to a synagogue than to set foot in one. But he did understand that what was going on with the Nazis was, was an existential threat uh, to him and, and to his family um, that was still back in Europe. And so he began very um, to sort of support these refugees as they came in. He ended up owning many buildings in Shanghai. He converted many of them um, to sort of refugee centers. Um, he owned a lot of property in this poor Chinese neighborhood of Hankyu that I had visited with the mezuzahs on the, um, on the doorposts. And um, he began to house uh, Jewish refugees there. At the same time, the second family that I write about, the Kaduri family, um, had always been in Victor Sassoon's shadow. Um, they were quite wealthy, quite successful, um, but they were always kind of, um, you know, one step behind Victor, who was such a glamorous character. And Ellie Kaduri, who was the, the patriarch of that family, at one point goes to Victor, uh, goes to the Cafe Hotel, goes up to his office and says, Victor, you know, you're the most prominent person in Shanghai and you need to step forward to help these Jewish refugees. And at that point, these two families together begin to work um, uh, to help these refugees. The Kaduris establish a school um, for Jewish refugee children. They staff it with Jewish refugee teachers um, and they work hand in hand with, um, with Victor um, to create a life um, for these Jewish refugees. The other remarkable thing that Victor does is he basically uses all his charm and all his political skills to convince the Japanese to protect these Jewish refugees. At the same time the refugees were arriving, the Japanese were encircling Shanghai. They had started invading Manchuria. They were gradually advancing um, on Shanghai and, and essentially had encircled it and had occupied parts of the city. 
and they were allied with the Germans. And so the Germans were pressuring uh, the Japanese to take care of their Jewish problem. And um, Victor Sassoon very cleverly began to woo the Japanese. The Japanese put an anti-Semitic Japanese colonel in charge uh, of the Jewish issue in Shanghai, these refugees who were showing up. And he met with Victor Sassoon. And Victor Sassoon put on this charm offensive. He invited the Japanese officers to come to his nightclubs, to eat at the Cathay Hotel. And the Japanese believed in a way they were, they were anti-Semitic for sure, but they also believed that, that the Jews were so influential in the world economy and that Victor Sassoon was so influential that um, he would be able to keep America out of the war and keep Britain out of the war. And Victor Sassoon did nothing to kind of disabuse uh, the Japanese anti-Semitic military of this notion. And so he would invite the Japanese military in. He would say, I'll talk to Churchill. I'll talk to the Americans. Uh, at the same time, he was flying to South America to see if he could buy land where the Jews might be resettled. But nothing, nothing came of that. So the upshot of this is that even as these Jews kept on arriving, um, that the Japanese kept on, uh, in a sense, protecting them. They didn't move against them. Um, finally, they caught on to what Victor was doing, and Victor Sassoon had to, um, had to flee the country. But it is one of the miracles of World War II that 18,000 Jewish refugees from Nazism lived in Shanghai throughout the entire war, and none of them were killed by the Japanese. In fact, um, the, the Germans started sending um, members of the SS to Shanghai saying to the Japanese, look, you have all these Jews here, here's what you should do, gather them up, put them on barges, take them out to the river and sink them and that'll take care of your Jewish problem. And the Japanese were appalled by this and, and still believe that somehow these Jews could be a useful bargaining chip or, or something. And so um, they protected them. They, they put them in a ghetto, um, but it was nowhere near as bad as it was um, in Europe. And in fact, when you talk to the Jewish refugees who included people like Michael Blumenthal, who became secretary of the treasury, uh, Mike Medavoy, who became a very powerful uh, Hollywood agent uh, and executive, uh, Lawrence Tribe, a Harvard law professor, these were all uh, refugees who had grown up in Shanghai as children, one of the things they say over and over again was how nice the Chinese in Shanghai were to them. That they had fled places in Berlin and Vienna where their neighbors had turned against them, were chasing them down the street, were attacking them. And they came to China. And even though the, the Chinese didn't speak any German, couldn't communicate with them, they would share food. They would look after their children, that there was this bond that was created um, between the Chinese who were suffering from the Japanese occupation and the Jews who were displaced and, and had, had, to flee, had, had to flee Europe. So as I said, uh, both the Kaduris and Victor Sassoon were very smart businessmen, um, but they weren't great politicians. And so um, after the war uh, is over, uh, both families um, return um, the Kaduris, quite tragically, had not gotten out in time. So their father, Eli Kaduri, had died in Japanese captivity. The Kaduris had been kept in a Japanese prison camp. But both families, the Sassoons and the Kaduris, believed that, you know, things could return to what they were like before the war, and they could regain their kind of exalted status in Shanghai. But of course, that turned out not to be true. The communists um, moved in, and they, um, they conquered Shanghai, and both families had to leave. And here the story takes a bit of a pivot. The Sassoons at that point left. Um, Victor Sassoon left Shanghai with a return ticket, uh, but he never returned. Um, and he lost almost all of his fortune because it was tied up in these buildings like the Cafe Hotel and all these investments he had in Shanghai. And while he still had, you know, I'm sure tens of millions of dollars, at one point he had been uh, one of the richest men in the world, in fact, when the Chinese conquered Shanghai, they seized all the Sassoon business records. And then in the 1980s went through them and I was able to gain access to them as well. And the Chinese concluded that the Sassoons had probably made over a billion dollars uh, in their time in China. And most of that was, was lost. Um, so the Sassoons never went back. The Kaduris by contrast had understood that um, Shanghai might, might not be the most stable place. And they had moved a lot of their money and investments to Hong Kong. 
And so uh, after the communists took over, the Kaduris moved to Hong Kong and stayed there. Um, and part of what was so interesting was that the, the father had died uh, in captivity. And so there were two brothers remaining, um, uh, uh, Lawrence Kaduri and Horace Kaduri. They were in their 40s. And they had grown up under the shadow of their father, who was, I don't know, maybe a little bit uh, overbearing for sure, who had always, you know, kind of run things. And this was their chance to, um, to really um, uh, take over the family and learn some of the lessons of Shanghai. And one of the things the, the, the next generation believed was that their father had lived in a bubble in Shanghai. He had lived in this great mansion that I had visited with 40 rooms for just three people. Um, and that while Chinese were dying in the street, the Kaduris had basically just made more and more money. And so the, the next generation of Kaduris starting in the 1950s decided they really had to understand China better. And so they began to help Chinese refugees who were leaving um, who were leaving China uh, as the communists took over and began to help them build um, uh, uh, small farms, um, uh, support agricultural research so that these refugees pouring into Hong Kong from China um, could, could begin to make a living. And in the end, they, they helped more than 300,000 Chinese refugees and, and, and their help extended to offering loans to farmers. Um, they did a lot of research, for example, on pigs and on pork production because pork was a staple of the Chinese diet. And they funded a lot of research into how to efficiently raise pigs and bigger pigs. In fact, the Chinese used to joke that the Kaduris knew everything about pigs except what it tasted like because they were Jewish and they wouldn't, they wouldn't eat pork. Um, so uh, the Kaduris become very prominent in Hong Kong. And um, politically, they were very clever as well. They never said a bad word um, about, um, about the communists, um, because they always believed that at some point China would open up again. And sure enough, in 1978, when China uh, opens up and launches the four modernizations, one of the first phone calls that Beijing makes um, is to the Kaduris, asking them to come back and to start investing in China. And so the Chinese begin to invest um, uh, millions of dollars um, in China. They build a nuclear power plant. Um, they do all sorts of other investments. And they become very important in terms of, of negotiating um, the handover of, of Hong Kong um, to China. Um, and obviously now for them, and we can maybe talk about this in the, in the chat, um, now it is very scary for them, I think, because like in Shanghai, they are once again kind of trapped in Hong Kong. Um, they have a huge fortune there. They're probably the wealthiest Western family um, in China. They're worth $13 billion. So they're one of the richest families in the world. And yet so many of their assets are, are locked into Hong Kong. And I sometimes think that they look around now in the 21st century and wonder if the story of China is going to, um, is going to repeat itself. Um, one thing I just want to mention before I, I turn to your questions is the role of women in this history is really fascinating. Um, the women, um, it, it's very hard to find out about women because especially when you're writing about, you know, imperial history or colonial history in the 19th century, the early 20th century, just women don't appear. They're not, you know, they're not writing letters. They're not doing business deals. They're not meeting with politicians. But I was very fortunate in that um, the Kaduri family uh, had really a remarkable group of women. Uh, one of them was Laura Kaduri, um, who had married um, Ellie Kaduri, the patriarch of the family. And um, Ellie Kaduri had begun to make his fortune in China. Around 1895, he goes to London and he, um, uh, he meets this very wealthy Jewish aristocrat. She was a very prominent, from a very prominent Jewish family in London, and they get married. And typically what would happen then is that she would stay in London, you know, with the children, and then Ellie would go back and forth to China and kind of continue to make his fortune. But Laura Kaduri was a very spirited person, and she announced that she was going to go to China um, with, uh, with her husband. And so she sailed with him to Hong Kong, landing there um, in 1898. And then proceeded not only to have two children there, but to keep a diary 
And the family had kept this diary all these years. And it's just a remarkable document where she writes about what it was like for her traveling around China uh, from about 1898 um, uh, to about 1918. And, and you read the diary and it's almost like reading, it's almost like a Catherine Hepburn movie, like the African Queen, where she's on these ships going up the river and the Japanese attack it, or she's you know, going through the streets of Shanghai in a rickshaw and, and, and seeing the, the poverty all around her. She was an incredibly progressive woman. And I think in both families, the women ended up being sort of the conscience of these families. Um, Laura Kaduri starts a number of, of schools for Chinese girls because she believed that it was very important that Chinese girls get educated. A remarkably kind of far-sighted view um, for someone uh, at the turn of the turn of the 20th century. Um, and um, she never leaves China. She settles in China with her with her husband and her two boys. And one of the things she says to her husband is, after all this traveling, is that she really wants to a settled place in Shanghai. And so they buy a mansion, not the, the big mansion that they'll build later, um, and they settle down. And then uh, one evening, um, there is a fire in the mansion and people run out of the mansion. But Laura Kaduri doesn't see the governess who's been taking care of her two boys. And so she runs back into the mansion into this blazing fire to save uh, to save the governess. It turned out the governess had gone out a different door. Uh, Laura Kaduri gets lost in all the smoke and she dies in this house fire in 1920. Um, her, um, her boys are, are, are about 18 or 20 um, and um, it shatters the family, obviously. But it's also important because the Chinese are fascinated by that story. And even to this day, they talk about the fact that a British woman, a wealthy British woman, would go into a, a raging fire to save a Chinese servant. And I, I think that illustrates some of the kind of complex relationships that these families had with China, that they were imperialist, they were colonial. But I would argue in many ways, they also opened up China to the wider world. They did business deals with the Chinese. The Cafe Hotel was a place where many uh, wealthy Chinese would go for dinner and for parties and to learn about the West. Um, uh, they were, the, these families were involved in, in charity. Um, and so I think when we look at China's history, we have to accept its complexity. You know, the, the Chinese communists often want to say that, well, China was this great imperial, had this great imperial history. Um, then the Americans and the British and everyone came in and colonized it. Then the communists came along and, and, and things have been great ever since. But there is a cosmopolitan history of China, globalization that took place in the 20s and 30s. And, and this family, these families were very much at the center of it. And I think kind of recreating their history is really important to understand um, what makes China tick. And obviously Hong Kong is another example of that. Whereas we see that the, the DNA that these families left and that the British and others left in a place like Hong Kong did really affect the Chinese who lived there um, and gave them an appreciation for the rule of law and for um, having uh, a government institutions that were not corrupt. And so I, I think that, you know, this is a great family saga, obviously, it's a great economic saga, um, but it's also a saga about China. Um, and, um, and that we have to understand that the growth of China is very much tied up with its previous openings to the world. Um, and that these families in, in all their, you know, the good and bad things they did um, played a, a, a very key part in China's, China's rise. Um, so I'll stop there and, and uh, Joe, if you wanna share any questions, I'd love to, I'd love to answer them. Yeah. Yeah, we do have some questions coming in and it's not too late to uh, ask a question. Just click the Q&A uh, button at the bottom of your Zoom window. Okay, so uh, first questions, uh, there's a, a couple of them and they're coming from Mike. Um, how did you do your research? It's the first question. What were your sources? Um, no, it's a great question. Um, it was a lot of work. Okay, so because these were families that had global empires. And so I ended up going um, to Shanghai a lot, to Jerusalem, to London, um, you know, because the archives and the family was scattered 
um, all around the world at this point. Um, I was lucky in a number of things. Um, when I started the research for this, um, China was still relatively open. And so the archives in Shanghai were available and I had a Shanghai, a Chinese researcher. Um, I speak some Chinese, but I can't read it. Um, I had a Chinese researcher go through a lot of the papers that were in Shanghai that the Chinese government had seized when they'd taken over um, these businesses. Um, those papers are not accessible anymore. So I was lucky in that we were able to sort of see them before things um, closed up. Um, in Hong Kong, the Kaduri family um, had kept their own archive. And because I guess one of the things when you're worth $13 billion, your archive isn't just a bunch of papers you keep in the attic. They actually had a professional archive with an archivist and several people working there. And they had saved everything. I mean, they had saved not just business agreements, but they had saved letters um, from various members of the family. And one of the things that was so interesting was that the two brothers um, uh, who had basically run the business in Hong Kong and in Shanghai um, in the 30s, basically wrote to each other almost every day. And they wrote to each other um, on these uh, uh, pages that had multiple carbons. And so they would write a memo or type a memo, say the Shanghai brother to the Hong Kong brother. Then the Hong Kong brother would write on it and send the carbon back. And then the Shanghai brother would write on that and send that carbon back. So it was almost like Facebook. You almost had this kind of dialogue going on, which allowed you to see how the brothers interacted. And it was very much the elder brother was always lording it over the younger brother and criticizing him. I mean, you really got to see how the families operated. Um, in London, there were a very kind of, I had to go to both the British archives, the British library, and I, I had to be very diligent. It was almost like a detective case because at one point, some of the best things I found had been misfiled in the British library. There were letters that Victor Sassoon, um, the playboy uh, who had built the cafe hotel, um, there were letters that had been written to a, a, a paramour of his in, uh, in London. And they were actually filed under India instead of China. And, I, and I, one of the archivists had stumbled on it and said, would these be useful? And they were these incredibly detailed letters that Victor had written. And it was almost like you could hear his voice in these letters, just kind of wafting off the page. And that was, that was really valuable. Um, as well as a lot of the British documents that documented how influential the Sassoons were in British society, the parties they had in Britain. Um, they became very good friends with uh, King Edward um, and would go with him on rest cures. I mean, it was, it was really a gold mine. Um, and then the other two places, one was in Jerusalem. And as I mentioned, um, the, um, uh, David Sassoon had these eight sons um, in, the, in the 19th century. And um, he was a very controlling father and ran his business. And the way he ran his business was by writing to each of his eight sons every single day with instructions. And then he would get sort of intelligence from London and, and from Shanghai and elsewhere. Now, the letters were written in, in what's called Judeo-Arabic, which I think only about a dozen people in the world still speak. Um, and the reason they did that was that it was kind of a built-in code. Remember, Shanghai was very uh, competitive. There was a lot of spying that went on. But by writing in Judeo-Arabic, um, the, the, the father made sure that only his sons could read these letters, and then they would write back to him. But my dilemma was, how do you, how do you find out what these letters sent, uh, said? So I was fortunate in that at the library in Jerusalem, which had been given these letters, um, the professor in charge of them could speak the language. And I remember sitting with him in his apartment for several days in Jerusalem as he took letter after letter and kind of tra translated it for me and read them to me. And, and even though there were, there were thousands of them, he kind of picked a selection. And again, that gave me a sense of, of how the family interacted. And then kind of most bizarrely, Victor Sassoon, the playboy, um, didn't marry until he was 65. Um, he married his nurse. Um, he had left Shanghai at this point, moved to the Bahamas, where he had set up kind of his, uh, his life and his empire there. And um, he married his nurse and um, his nurse uh, was from Dallas, Texas. So um, Victor died um, and then um, his, wife gave his diaries 
um, his business and social diaries to um, SMU in Dallas. So I went down to Dallas to, to kind of see what was there. And he, Victor had kept these incredibly detailed diaries where he not only put down every business deal, but also every dinner party he went to with a seating chart of who he was sitting next to. And he would color code the various people as a way to remind himself who he had met before, what their interests were. As I say, he was a very charming guy. So I was looking through these diaries in Texas that were you know, taking me back to Shanghai in the 1930s. And suddenly these photographs start dropping out. And they were photographs of naked women, naked European women, naked Chinese women. And I couldn't figure out what was going on. Well, it turned out Victor was an amateur photographer. And one of the ways he picked up women was by inviting them to his studio and offering to take their picture. These pictures, it turned out, were often of them naked. And then he would tuck them in uh, into his diary along with his, you know, business deals and and conversations with Chiang Kai-shek and, and all that. So there were it, it was kind of these, these moments where you would get these glimpses into these characters, not only by what they wrote, but what were the things that they kept. And clearly Victor's uh, naked pictures of, of these women he met were very, uh, were very important to him. A couple of, uh, let's see, Barbara and Mike both asked uh, the same question, which is uh, what are the two families now doing and are they still influential? Yeah, well, the Sassoon family is actually quite influential um, in Britain. Um, they're very well known. And um, what happened essentially was that um, of the eight sons that I talk about, um, most of them went to Britain and quickly got um, gained access to British society. They sent their children to Eton and to Oxford and to Cambridge, um, and they became kind of enraptured by the, 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 the life of the British aristocracy. And they became quite prominent um, in the British government. They served in the cabinet. They were friends of Churchill. Um, and today, the Sassoon name is very well known in Britain um, because of the prominence that many of them had um, in the British government. Um, they don't do much business anymore because most of that fortune was lost. Um, um, but actually it's interesting, um, one of the most prominent Sassoons, Lord Sassoon, um, who's the current head of the family, was the economics minister in the British government a few years ago in the David Cameron government, um, kind of like being secretary of the treasury. And so he actually went to uh, China to have a series of official meetings with the Chinese finance minister. And he, I, I met with him in, uh, in London. He has this you know, incredible office. And, and so we're talking and he told me this wonderful story that he, he, it was the first time he'd been back in China and he's meeting with a Chinese finance minister. And it's a very formal arrangement as you would expect with translators and all that. They're negotiating some kind of a trade deal. And at the beginning, the Chinese finance minister, you know, being very charming, says, oh, Lord Sassoon, your name is very well known in China. Um, we, know, we, uh, we, we know how deep your family's involvement has been in Chinese history. So Lord Sassoon, who's a bit of a, has a good sense of humor, said, well, you know, um, it would be nice if China, as it opens up, would do what Eastern Europe did when, when it opened up and got rid of communism, and it restored a lot of the property that people had owned in these countries before communism to its original owners. If you and China did that, my family would be much richer now um, than it is. At which point, the, the Chinese minister leans forward and in English says, let's let bygones be bygones. You know, which I think is kind of a wonderful moment of, of sort of understanding how the, the Chinese understood what was going on and, and, and kind of use that. Um, now, the Kaduris, as I say, are incredibly uh, influential. Um, they're one of the richest families in Asia. They're worth more than $13 billion. They own the Peninsula Hotel chain, which is now a worldwide chain. They own the electricity company uh, in Hong Kong. Um, they, they have a lot of clout. Um, and, um, and they were very influential in, in the handover negotiations. And they meet regularly with the Chinese leadership. Members of the Kaduri family have met with every Chinese leader um, since Mao died. Um, they met with Xi Jinping most recently. Um, so, um, so they are influential, but I think, as I said, they also face this dilemma that despite their wealth and, and their power, um, they are kind of very much 
beholden to the Chinese government as it cracks down um, on, um, on, uh, on Hong Kong. And in fact, Michael Kaduri, who is the head of the family now, I called him just before the book came out, I called him to see if he would talk to me about the protests in Hong Kong and what was going on. And he wrote a very funny note back. He said, well, Jonathan, he said, you know, I've been traveling a lot, so I'm not really up to the latest developments in Hong Kong. Now, I know, of course, he knew exactly what was going on in Hong Kong, but he didn't really want to talk about it um, because uh, he knew that it was going to be very sensitive. So, um, you know, like Microsoft or Google or Facebook, I mean, all these companies that are dealing with China have to tread this very um, narrow bridge um, between trying to make money as businesses, but also recognizing the influence and the power the Chinese government has over them. Okay, so uh, next question comes from Nan and Eugene, who first off wants to say hello, Jonathan. Um, Hi, Nan. Hi, Nan. <laughs> uh, let's see, the questions are, uh, were the Jews of Shanghai able to maintain Jewish traditions? And also, did any remain in China after the war? Um, that's a great question. Um, yeah, there, are, there were in fact five synagogues uh, built in the 1920s and 30s in Shanghai by these Baghdadi families and then others. Um, there was a group of Russian Jews who ended up in Shanghai after the revolution. Um, and so, um, and some of these synagogues were built by the Sassoon family. So there was kind of a a robust Jewish life in Shanghai. And even during World War II, when the Jews were kind of kept in a ghetto, they were able to study to be rabbis, to go to Jewish schools and to go to services. Now that all ended when the communists took over in 1949. And in fact, several of the synagogues were turned into warehouses. One was turned into an insane asylum. Um, when China opened up again, um, one of the things the Chinese realized is that these could be tourist sites, that Jews, many of them, the children of refugees who had been there began to come back um, and, and wanted to see where their parents or grandparents had lived. And so the synagogues have been turned, some of them into museums um, that you can visit. Um, but there's no Jewish life. The only Jewish life there is in Shanghai now are expatriate Jews who um, you know, have services in, uh, in hotels and, and, and things like that. So, so in that sense, um, Jewish life has ended. Um, the Jews don't stay um, in part because they never wanted to be in China in the first place, the Jewish refugees. So as soon as the war ended, um, they begin to go to Palestine, to, um, to Australia, to the United States, um, and, um, and to other parts of Europe to try to reclaim their former lives. One of the heartbreaking things I learned was that these Jewish refugees had been in China, but they'd been really isolated during the war. And their lives were very difficult. There wasn't enough food. They were living, many of them were middle-class Jews in Berlin and Vienna. They were living in cramped living conditions, you know, a couple of families to an apartment. And so they, they really felt they had suffered during the war. But when the Americans liberate liberate Shanghai after the war, they begin to put up um, uh, uh, records and, uh, and posters listing what had happened to the villages back home and the cities and neighborhoods back home that many of these refugees had left. And it's heartbreaking to see the photographs as you see these Jewish refugees who had been cut off from, from the Holocaust, essentially, realizing in 1945 what could have happened to them. Um, all the people who had died, their villages wiped out, their family and neighbors gone. And so many of them had to just start a new life. There was no going back to Vienna or to Berlin. And so they went to Australia or to San Francisco um, uh, or to Palestine. Um, and, and that really was their fate. Um, they always carried an affection for China, but it was never a place they'd intended to wash up in. And um, there was really no life for them there. Um, just a quick note, it's coming up on the top of the hour. Um, I don't want to keep you if it's getting too late. We do have more questions if you're willing sure, to. Sure, no, uh, I'd be happy to take a few more questions. Okay. Uh, the next one uh, we'll, we'll get uh, from Jeff Kinkley. Did the Sassoons and Kadoris have any curiosity about the ancient Jews in Kaifeng, et cetera? Yeah, that's an interesting question. Um, there, there was this fascination and 
Um, I think both families contributed some money to sort of find out about this so-called lost tribe of Jews. Um, but it was interesting when I was, uh, when I visited, um, when I visited, started visiting some of the Jewish sites, there are some archives there that you could go through. And apparently what happens is uh, Matteo Ricci, who is a, a priest, um, goes to China, I think in like the 1300s or 1400s, and he hears about these, the, this lost tribe of Jews in Kaifeng. And so he writes to them and he says, you've been a lost tribe. Um, while you were lost, the Messiah came, Jesus came, and we would like you now to accept uh, uh, Jesus as your savior and become Christian. And so this group of, of Jews who are, have been living in real isolation write back to him and they say, thank you for your letter. We don't really believe what you're saying, but you seem like a very smart man. Would you like to come and be our rabbi? So there was this kind of interesting, you know, way in which the, 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 two, the two groups were sort of talking separately to each other. What is interesting now is that when I first went to China in 1979, um, you could ask about the Kaifeng Jews because it was distant in the past and, and all that. You could not ask about the Kanduris and the Sassoons because it was still kind of old China, communist China, Mao had just died. Now things have reversed. Um, the Chinese themselves are fascinated by the Sassoons and the Kanduris. Um, they want to talk about the, they're restoring all these sites, but you can't talk about religion. And in fact, some American groups that have been trying to kind of figure out what happened to the Kaifeng Jews or if any descendants still exist have been slapped down by the Chinese government because as we know with the Uyghurs and others, religion's a very hot topic. So it's a way that in China, everything is political, including history. And, and that's kind of one area where it's playing out. Uh, next up, we have a couple questions from Barbara, including one question that came that I thought of. Um, such a steamy saga is a movie in the works. <laughs> yeah, well, from your mouth to God's ears, as my mother used to say. Um, yeah, we've gotten a lot of interest. I, I actually have a Hollywood lawyer, which I never thought I would have. Um, I mean, it's interesting. One of the, you know, two things are interesting. One is, you know, I love the book because it's a saga and it, it, it spans all over the world. Movie producers look at that and just all they see are the dollar signs. You're going to have to film in Shanghai and Hong Kong and London and Baghdad. And, and so that's a little daunting. But there is interest. And, and you know, I, I, I think it is kind of a great story. The other thing that's really interesting um, is that the Chinese are translating the book and publishing it in China, which I found kind of amazing um, given, you know, China-U.S. relations. Um, and it's being published by the Chinese Academy of Social Sciences, which is sort of like the Brookings Institution if Brookings really ran the government. This is sort of the government's think tank. And what that says to me is that there is a desire, I think, on the part of some in China, certainly intellectuals, to recapture and, and uncover this history. That even though China is very nationalistic now, there is a fascination uh, among the Chinese to understand all the different strains that shape Chinese history, not just the China strain or not just the communist strain. So again, just from a movie point of view, that's good because obviously anything you're gonna to have to film would have to be filmed in China. So, so that would be good, but, but more I'm sort of encouraged by that because I feel like it's a sign that China wants to learn about this history as well. And I'm, I'm hoping that um, you know, when the book comes out, um, it, you know, it'll give people an opportunity to talk about it because especially in Shanghai, there's a fascination with these families um, and they want to understand what, what role they played. Um, Barbara's other question, uh, a good one. Have the families read the book and what did they think of it, if so? Yeah, you know, as a journalist, um, typically you don't show stories to your subjects, right? That's kind of an ethical rule. But with this book, I felt differently. I mean, quite frankly, I felt with the Kaduri family, you don't want a family that's worth $13 billion to be mad at you. Um, you don't want them suing you or things like that. But I also felt that, um, that it was important for me to get the history right. And so I sent drafts to both families. Um, and I said in my letter, I said, look, this is the history that I've written. I'd appreciate your input to correct any facts that are wrong, but you have to understand that the interpretation is my own. And while we can disagree about it, 
in the end, it's, it's my book and it's not like you have approval or anything like that. So the Sassoons, because they've been prominent for so long, were terrific. Um, Lord Sassoon read the book, wrote me a very long, nice letter, adding some information that it was useful to know, and then basically said, you know, as you say, interpretations may differ, but I, I wish you the best of luck. The Kaduris, who had never really been written about before, um, kind of, it, it got a little contentious. And it was interesting to me, the two things they felt most strongly about were one, um, I refer to their grandfather as being stout. And they wrote this email back to me saying, he wasn't stout, he was big boned and he was barrel chested. And, and I kind of felt like, okay, so I just described it, right? So, but it kind of felt like, say whatever you want, but just don't call grandpa fat. So I was, I was happy uh, changing that. And the other thing they wanted me to change was that I had referred to one of the houses, a summer house they had um, in Hong Kong as a mansion, which it is. It's this beautiful mansion that, that uh, overlooks a, a harbor in a more rural part of Hong Kong. And they wrote back and they said, it's not a mansion, it's a cottage. And I really puzzled over that, but then I realized they were thinking of it like the Newport cottages, you know, the, that when wealthy people would build these cottages, they'd have, you know, 40 rooms and artwork and stuff. So instead I decided to just describe the building. And I quoted someone as saying the first time he visited, he thought it was a hotel. So that kind of got it across. But, um, but in the end, you know, both families were, um, you know, they were good about it. And I know there are things they disagree with. And, and obviously the history that we tell ourselves as families is not what history is. I think for the Kaduris especially, a lot of the stories they'd been told by their families, it turned out, were not accurate. The way family stories that we tell, if you ever check them out, would turn out not to be not to be fully accurate. But in the end, they they were both you know uh, they were both very supportive. And I think the fact that the book has gotten such good reviews and you know it's a bestseller in Hong Kong. I mean, I just think there's a way in which they kind of understood that they should embrace this uh, rather than uh, rather than fight with me. And, and, I, and I think I got the history right, but it's always complicated when, when someone writes about you. But, but in the end, I thought they were good sports about it. Maybe um, one more question? Okay, yeah, this one actually will cover a few people because uh, a, a common question is, is, what is what's happened to the properties that the Sassoon and Kaduri families uh, had? Um, are they in existence? Are they being used for the same purpose? Maybe you can talk a bit about the hotels and, and properties they, they have. Sure. Yeah, on. no, they're all still there. I mean, they're beautiful buildings. I mean, a lot of that, that Art Deco period that you see on the Bund in Shanghai, many of those uh, buildings were built by by the Sassoons or by the Kaduris. Um, the Cafe Hotel still exists. It's now um, uh, it's now a uh, it's now called the Peace Hotel. Um, it's a luxurious hotel, um, beautifully restored. And one of the things that it's owned by a very prominent Chinese hotel firm that closed it for a couple of years uh, about ten years ago, and and really did a fantastic job, and really embraced the history. So you go there, and there are pictures of Victor Sassoon there. There are, you know, the, the ballroom they've restored, the restaurants they've restored. You really walk in there and get a sense of what of what Shanghai once was like. Um, the Kaduri Hotels in Shanghai, uh, one at one point was the Russian Embassy. Um, it's now being turned into an art hotel. Uh, another one has become kind of an office building. Um, Victor Sassoon built a number of beautiful office buildings, one of which was actually used to sign the Shanghai Communique. It was one of the nicest buildings in Shanghai at the time. And so when uh, Kissinger, uh, when, when Nixon went over to, to sign the Shanghai Communique with Joe and Lai, it was in the lobby of one of Victor's uh, office buildings. Um, when you go into these buildings, it is like stepping back in time because they have these tall ceilings and beautiful walnut uh, 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 furnishings. And in a couple of the buildings I went into, if you walk in in the front, right by the elevators, these buildings were built in the 1930s. There are like Chinese propaganda posters up. But if you lift the posters up, the original directory is still there. And so you see all these names of like the American Insurance Group and kind of all these companies that were in Shanghai, that, that they're still there kind of frozen in time, just papered over by um, 
by some of the uh, some of the Chinese posters. But you know, for anyone who's been to Shanghai or has the opportunity to go, I mean, you'll see Shanghai feels so different than the rest of China. It's so different than Beijing. And part of it is this feel of this Western influence that you can see, um, but also in the people. You know, one of the things that was so interesting to me when I was uh, writing the book was that the, the Cafe Hotel, now the Peace Hotel, when they reopened, they decided to set up a little museum um, that commemorated the history of the, of the hotel. And they put an ad in a, a Shanghai Chinese newspaper saying, if any of you remember the, Shang the Cafe Hotel or went there in the 30s and saved anything, um, bring it to us so we can display it. And I think they anticipated they'd get a few, you know, cups or, or, or maybe some, uh, you know, some memorabilia like that. And they were overwhelmed by the Chinese who showed up bringing photographs, photographs of these families with Victor Sassoon, uh, phonograph records that had been made in a booth that Victor had set up in the lobby where you would record toast to your uncle when he was celebrating his birthday. And it was almost as if all this history had been kept in people's closets or attics through the communist revolution, the cultural revolution, all these momentous events, and now was coming out again. And so I think for the Chinese too, these buildings are very important because they are a connection to history. And the fact that the Chinese haven't knocked them down the way they've torn down so much in Beijing and throughout China to kind of modernize. Um, so you now have, when you go to Shanghai, kind of these, these two parts of Shanghai, you have the high-tech uh, Pudong with those buildings that look like they're out of the Jetsons. And then you have this Art Deco 1930s uh, Shanghai right across the river. And, um, and I think that's kind of what's wonderful about Shanghai is that there are very few places where you can literally walk down a street and look to your left and look to your right and see China's past and its future and, and see the way that they're, the way that they're connected. Fascinating story. Fascinating. Um, well, thank you very much. Uh, I know it's after 11. I think you're in Boston, so it's, uh, it's getting kind of late for you, but uh, appreciate you taking the time to speak with us. Um, and thank you all for joining us tonight. Um, stay safe and um, keep an eye out for future China chats. And don't forget to pick up your copy of The Last Kings of Shanghai. Um, interesting stuff. Great. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you all for joining us. Yes. Thank you. Good night, everyone.